Hey, welcome. It's Kurt Thompson, and I'm reviewing a breathing apparatus device. And originally, it's designed for patients that have had some type of surgery and they're trying to get their lungs back in order after anesthesia. But for us brass plane folks, and well, actually, I shouldn't be um, brassist, should I? Um, <laughs> Okay, let me not be brassist, and let me say that it's for all wind musicians, vocalists, and woodwind players, as well as brass musicians. So, for most brass players, now I'm not really going to go into woodwind players and vocalists, but for most brass players, to get the ultimate best out of your playing, especially in the extreme upper register, you have to synchronize three stages of compressing the air. The first stage is the diaphragmatic breathing. Breathing as deep as you possibly can and putting as much pressure on the lungs and diaphragm. That's the first stage. The second stage is the bottleneck at your throat and tongue arch. And you've heard band directors say, don't pinch off your throat. Don't pitch the air with your throat. Uh, well, they're absolutely ridiculous, and they're probably just regurgitating uh, what their instructor told them. That's nonsense. The only way you could not have a bottleneck and not pinch off the air at your throat would be if you were a dolphin or a whale. In other words, if you breathe straight up through the, a hole in the top of your head, then there's no pinching off. Um, but there's an L shape that happens when the air comes up to your throat, it makes a right angle and comes out your mouth. There's a bottleneck there, regardless of what your band director may say. There's a bottleneck there, there's going to be um, a resistance. That bottleneck combined with your tongue and tongue arch creates the second stage of compressing. And then the final third uh, third phase of compressing the air would be at your aperture. You know, if you have a big <laughs> aperture, loose, flapping your lips, um, or you know, maybe let's just say on a reed instrument, maybe you're using a Rico number one reed, and it's just um, soft, and you you're able to have a, a lot of air go in at one time. Um, well, you're not going to be compressing the air as efficiently. So these are the three stages. And what these devices, I have several tutorial tutorials coming your way. What these devices actually work on is the first stage of compressing the air. The, for those of you who like analogies, the first stage of compressing the air is just like the principle of the jet engine. You know, the jet engine and the propeller plane are two different animals, right? Uh, you get a lot more power from the... Um, jet engine. In the jet engine, you can think of uh, scientifically blowing up a balloon and let it as, as much as you can before it pops and then letting it go. And you remember, you, you can see it kind of flutter around and go in circles around the room. That's the principle of jet propulsion. And that's actually what our first stage of compression is. We're, think of our lungs as a balloon. We're inhaling to the max and maybe even beyond that creating this ultimate pressure that on its own the energy wants to come out through our mouth it wants to expel you know through our mouth that energy is what is one third required to get the best tone the best endurance the best sound the best control and the best range so it makes sense if you're a vocalist if you're a sax player, I would say even more so if you're a flute player, really, it would really make sense to work on this stage of compressing the air. So I have several tutorials coming your way. And this, I might just leave this introduction for all three tutorials. So if you've, if you've seen one tutorial, you might have heard this introduction. But don't worry, I'll be going into the particular details of the new device. So anyway, I'm Kurt Thompson. You're going to see me do some demonstrations as well. So it won't just be a speaking video with some pictures. You're going to see me demonstrate these devices. And right now, right now I have three devices in mind. So you might see 
a series of three videos on diaphragmatic breathing, inspiration, and improving your respiratory system, and the first stage of compression for any brass player, vocalist, or woodwind player. Please go over to Patreon, become a supporter, support my channel and my work and what I'm doing. I really need your help. Thank you so much. This is Kurt Thompson. You are looking at the expand -a lung breathing device, and you're going to see me demonstrate this one. I've been using this one for years, in fact, uh, more than a decade. It really is the best device that I've used, and you're, you're going to see several other reviews on these devices, which are worthy, but this one is by far the best, and it really is quite amazing uh, what it can do for you. So anybody that has fun in music through their breath, whether a, a flautist, a saxophone player, a tuba player, um, or a female or male vocalist, uh, you're going to benefit by this one. Um, also, if you speak for a living or have to do a lot of public speaking, or you do voiceovers, you'll be benefited by this particular device. And then finally, it's actually marketed to athletes. So swimmers, Ironman competitors, triathletes, um, these type of folks. I guess it would apply to people that are weekend warriors, you know. You get out there and you play, you know, hoops you know, with your buds on the weekend and kill yourself. Or you're, maybe you're on a baseball or softball team, that kind of thing. Or maybe you do a lot of hiking or whatever. So this is um, the device that spans the gamut. It really does work. And for, there's, for most musicians, I've devised a way to do it that I think it works the best after so many years of doing this. And I don't do the blowout, the exhalation. Um, I only work on the inhalation, or as they say, technically, inspiration. So we're going to be working on that. You're going to see me demonstrate that. And this is a device that I mandate that people get when they're in my 16-week course. It um, really is a mandatory, it's not an optional thing because it really does make a difference. It's part of the first stage of compression. And if you can, let's just say that you have chop problems and you, you've done all you can to build up your chop strength and you've hit a wall. Well, you, you, I'm going to help you overcome that. But in the interim, you can be improving the other two stages of compression, which would be diaphragmatic breathing and the expanded lung concerns that, and the bottleneck at your throat and tongue arch. So there's a lot of ways to improve yourself and get around a few hurdles when it comes to your chops. And breathing correctly and syncing up all three stages of compression is mandatory. You must do that. So if you don't, you'll end up always having that strained type of sound and choppiness in your plane. Even if you do build up your chops, you'll you'll still have a choppiness and a strain to your sound. You won't have that effortless Bill Chase and Maynard Ferguson way of playing and sounding. So the expanded lung is an amazing device. And I have two ways that I do it, two ways that I've been teaching it now. I think, can I safely say more than 10 years? Yes, I have been teaching this to students now for more than 10 years. And uh, I'm sure they've gotten fantastic results especially if they've been using it i'm trying to go back to 10 years ago anybody that has been using this when i first started started with this if they've been doing it for a decade they surely have really increased their lung capacity and the mechanism for um, inhaling now by doing this what you're going to be helping yourself out later your older self is you're not going to be one of these persons that walks around with that green oxygen container and the the rubber hoses you know up their nose you know have you seen those people um they they walk around they have a cart and they walk they wheel the oxygen container around and uh, you're not going to be one of those typically those people um smoke too much or maybe they were a coal miner or maybe they worked around asbestos or something like that um, but um, 
I'm here to tell you that I don't believe in that. I think that if you work your lungs properly, like we wind musicians, that you're just not going to end up like that. You know, I'm also a firm believer in cardiovascular stuff. So extreme hiking, walking, running, jogging, biking, um, you name it. Uh, I think people that are involved in that during their lifetime are not going to be you know, 80 years old, fumbling around with a green oxygen container. That's just not going to happen unless you have the worst luck in the world and you're one in a million that happens to you. I just don't believe otherwise it will. So by using these devices, you can stack the odds even further in your corner that when you get to be an old timer, you'll be able to walk around and do whatever you want and you won't have shortness of breath. So let me go ahead and whip this out and show you how I like to do it over to patreon become a supporter support my channel and my work and what i'm doing i really need your help thank you so much this is kurt thompson <laughs>
fabulous ferocity and energy of a David Sanborn. What's that? I'm hearing crickets. Cricket, cricket, cricket. Nobody. Hardly nobody. I mean, if, I, if I'm going to go listen to, let's say, five pro sax players in any kind of uh, situation, big band, uh, rhythm and blues, uh, let's see what else. Um, uh, small time jazz orchestra playing standards, um, you name it. Um, smooth jazz. All five are not going to have the amazing ability and sound and energy of a David Sanborn. You just not. You just didn't develop yourself to that level. And part of it might be because of your breathing. You really need to focus on breathing and developing that diaphragmatic breathing and it's even more so important for brass players because uh, hello we don't have an octave key and we don't have 12 15 17 20 keys to get all our notes it comes from our air and the manipulation of our embouchure so that said i'm trying to drive home a point this um, diaphragmatic breathing is very critical and a lot of people don't get that because a lot of band directors steered you the wrong way when they said Airflow, open up your mouth. Oh, ooh, ooh, oh. They didn't understand that the warm, slow breathing, the uh, air coming out is not going to help you. That air comes out, all your air can come out in a second or two. <sighs> that wasn't even a second. There, all my air just came out. What's that going to help me do on the instrument? It's not going to help me do anything. You have to learn how to compress that air. And that's what your band director forgot to tell you, maybe because they didn't know themselves. This is one thing that's going to help you. It's one part of the puzzle. Three stages of compression. Uh, the expanded lung is the premier diaphragmatic breathing device. In fact, I was just noticing on the site now they um, the Navy SEALs are actually using this. So before, uh, when I first started teaching this, it was um, Ironman competitors and triathletes and long-distance swimmers and runners and cyclists and stuff like that. But now this is... Uh, I guess the reputation of this has gone so far around the globe and everywhere that it's come back to the Navy SEALs and they've tried it and they actually have their Navy SEALs candidates use this to improve their conditioning. So, okay, now the two ways that I do it, enough lecture, but this is important stuff. I mean, you really should be hanging on my every word. Um, at the very least, you can see I prove um, what I say. I practice what I preach is another way to say it. And this guy has helped me out. I do this two ways. Now, there's a way to dial up the resistance. You may have noticed that this there's a black extension on the rubber part here. You maybe thought, well, what is that? If I get it close enough, there you go. You can see that this handle moves. See that? Now, what this does is it uh, allows a certain amount of air to escape. And it will open up to um, letting the most air that will escape for this particular device. Or you can close it off to where nothing comes in and out. So what I like to do is to um, play around with the resistance. So one way to, to do this would be to put a drag on your, a slight drag on your breathing, in your inhale. So that's all the way open, no resistance. And one technique would be just to exhale all your air and just breathe all your air and just breathe in. And that's putting a drag. <coughs> excuse me, is really working. It's putting a drag on your inhalation, or I guess I guess in the medical community they call it inspiration. So that's one way to do it. Now another way I like to do is a short burst is to add some resistance. This is the second way to do it, is to add some resistance. For, let me just give you an example of what happens when you turn it all the way in. Can't breathe anything there. So what I like to do is dial it in and take several short bursts of inhalations where you really can't get that much air. It's pl placing a tremendous load on the diaphragm to pull the air down and create that low pressure system in your body where the air rushes in. There's a vacuum being created there. And this puts a drag on your diaphragm. It must compensate and get stronger. So here we go. Let me open it back up. 
Okay, so let me close it up a little bit and do the second way I like to do. Okay, you probably notice there's a reduction of air. Now here's what I do when I have the resistance on. I'm being as dramatic and as energetic as I can and trying my best, like my life depended on it, to get as much air I can in that short little burst. So I feel like there's a different action happening on my diaphragm than when I just use little to no resistance and take one long breath. Both are good. I am convinced and I will guarantee you that if you get this and start working on it, it won't take more than a week for you before you start to go, wait a minute, <laughs> this thing really works. You will notice the benefit, whether your tone is more centered, whether your tone sounds better and richer and more vibrant, whether you're able to sustain longer passages, whether, you're, whether you have better endurance. And whether you're may, able to make your voice boom if you're a speaker and you have to speak to a large auditorium and you want your voice to carry out, this will actually do the job. I'm Kurt Thompson. There's a link in the description. I would highly recommend you get this and may, maybe pick up a couple for people you know that are involved in music and or speaking. Um, or if you have someone that's a crazy nut that likes to do those Ironman competitions, uh, uh, pick up one of these for them. Kurt Thompson here. I hope you enjoyed this very informative tutorial. It is going to be quite influential in what you do in regards to music. Uh, go ahead and like this. Look for that little red triangle, uh, rectangle down there that says subscribe. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you can see the more videos related to this and diaphragmatic breathing coming your way. And if you feel so inclined, make a comment down below and maybe even a suggestion uh, for another video if you like. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson. Welcome to the first day of the four-month Brass Upper Register Program. And this video series is going to go just about as close and follow the same track um, we would if we were just live, you and I, over the phone or via Skype. So that's um, one of the um, values is that, um, first of all, you got to remember this is a momentum-based program. So you are starting out with zero of my techniques and in four months you will be able to do all 65 techniques in one day. That's quite a feat of strength. So there is that momentum aspect. I'm going to ask you to try to do your best to keep this momentum going even though we're not interacting live. The um, 
the momentum aspect is actually, actually like one of the secret ingredients in my course, if you want to really call it that. It's um, just the ability just to kind of um, sneak a little bit more techniques and build more strength a little bit by little bit. Um, almost like boiling a frog in warm water, right? They don't know that they're cooked until it's too late. Same thing with you. Uh, you won't really realize all the strength that's happening until you take a look back and like especially at the halfway point where you can do 30 of these techniques in one day and feel great and you're stronger. Um, it'll dawn on you at some point. So that's how this works. We trickle out between three techniques and sometimes all the way up to eight or nine techniques in, um, in a weekly sitting. The format of the Brass Upper Register course goes like this if you are working with me live and I want to make it pretty close if when, we're, when you're following this video tutorial. The first four lessons are all brand new techniques. The fifth lesson, there are no brand new techniques and it's a time for review, a time to recap, a time to really go back and do a little dusting, a little polishing, a little shedding, make sure that you got the techniques down. Now, and then I'll just continue on with the format. So then lesson six through nine would be all new techniques again. Lesson 10 would be a big review. We go back and recap. Lesson 11 would typically typically be live lesson face-to-face -face, uh, where I'm going to be demonstrating some techniques over using Skype video. We don't have to worry about that here because I can demonstrate the techniques um, to your right through this uh, media. Lessons um, 12 through 15 would again be all new techniques and then the last lesson, the 16th week, uh, would be kind of a recap and just a you know, powwow and saying our, saying our goodbyes and all that kind of good stuff. So that said, you and I don't have the ability to do a review, obviously, through this media. So I'm making an option, and you really need to consider it, that um, you take advantage of some type of review with me live. So you will have gone through four of these lessons, and um, it would be good if I could hear you do them, answer any questions that you may have, and uh, basically we can do the review by phone because that's how I normally would do it anyway. If you're outside the U.S., we would just do it by Skype audio. But it's good for me to spot check things and make sure you're doing um, the techniques the way you're supposed to. And um, also I listen for things like um, any extra air in your tone, brittleness, tightness, stiffitis, loss of flexibility, and things like that that um, are kind of part and parcel of really working up a register. You really have to be careful of that and keep that at bay. And there's some things built into the course that will do that. So anyway, this four-month video course, this is the first video that you've likely gotten. And we're going to be doing exactly what I would do with you if you were speaking to me right now on the phone or over Skype. Now you can uh, transpose that or adjust that um, regard, depending on what instrument you play. So triple pedal concert B flat. So we're going way, way, way down. Um, that this would be even be low for tuba players. I mean, it's getting down there pretty low. It's not really um, accurate for me to say it's a duplicate of Claude Gordon stuff because it really is not. And I also put my own twist on it. So I just mentioned Claude Gordon because it does have the essence of Claude Gordon, but I'm I'm not really plagiarizing or, or borrowing his stuff note for note. I, I kind of do my own thing with it. So um, this is one of the uh, mega techniques of the course. Um, oh, by, this, by the way, this reminds me. The default for all techniques in this course is every day. That's about a fortissimo double C. You may wonder how I'm actually trying to fake my way up there and not get it. What I'm doing is I'm just scooting my lips out of the aperture. So when I was doing those hitting air notes, of course, you know, I could hit those notes. But what I was doing was I was widening the aperture almost to the point I was of a low C uh, positioning. So when I was, we hear all the air, it's because the aperture was very, very wide, as if I was playing below the staff. That's how I was able to do that. So anyway... Uh, I think that I've given you enough information, regardless of where your range is at, even if it's a lower than high C, if it's above high C, if it's above double C, double C, you got the great format for this one here. And if you really follow uh, my advice, don't overthink this technique, guys. Don't overthink it. Just do what I tell you to do on this one, including the rest, including the days off. And I think that you're going to be very, very happy with the results that come in. And they're going to come in uh, much, much quicker um, than you might think. 
Um, some people get results in this in this particular one in, in as little as just a couple of weeks, and that's when you compare a couple of weeks versus 52 weeks. I mean, that's just miraculous in my opinion. So this one is, this one is fantastic. I hope you enjoyed this video tutorial. You can play along with it um, every day. Um, not every day, of course, but every time that you do the particular technique, which would be every other day or every two days or however you decided to um, fashion in your program. And um, it's Kurt Thompson. Don't forget TrumpetSizzle.com. TrumpetSizzle.com. There are other um, uh, products there that you might like to enhance your playing. My site is, is mainly devoted to the power, endurance, and range aspect of playing. And so that's what most of my programs and my... Um, video tutorials do tend to focus on and uh, there's no coincidence there it is the most problematic area for any brass player endurance and range I'm Kurt Thompson have a good one Okay, we're back with the second installment on compression breathing, the three stages of compression. Um, who can tell me right now what was the first stage of compression for a brass plane? Anybody remember? Did you watch the first installment or are you just catching this one? If you didn't watch the first installment, I'll try to remember to put a link to the first installment, um, which is diaphragmatic breathing. Um, so I'm not going to go through all that because I already did. So there might be a link um, down in the description and um, you could probably click on that first and watch that and see how this all works. So diaphragmatic breathing, creating that um, pressure down in your lungs and your tummy and your diaphragm area. Now we're coming to the second stage of compression and this is the second installment. I'm Kurt Thompson. So if you saw me holding up um, two cylindrical objects, one, I guess you figured out it's a straw. This is an empty paper, um, sorry, the empty toilet roll holder, about the same size as a paper towel holder anyway. And so what does this have to do with today's lesson? <laughs> I'm always coming up with some, some good ways to teach, aren't I? But it's important. Stuff like this helps people get it. So second stage of compression is about there is a bottleneck despite what any orchestral player tells you about open up your throat open up your you know the cavity in your mouth open everything up keep it open don't pinch there is a bottleneck that happens at the throat if there wasn't a bottleneck and if we had an opening here on the top of her head and went straight out then that would be completely 100 percent free open um airflow right the nature of it coming out here and, and making a, like an upside down L and coming out this way automatically means it's not going to be 100% free air flowing. It's just not going to be. There is going to be a bottleneck there at the throat regardless. And that's if you have your tongue dropped into an ah position. Ah, or low C positioning for trumpet folks, I'm just using trumpet for example, is a no compression tongue position. Ah, you're not going to get much compression from the second stage. You can still get it from the first stage. You can still get it from the third stage, which we haven't talked about yet. But as far as uh, the second stage, you're only going to get a natural organic compression simply because of the bottleneck. The bottleneck of the throat. It's not, keep in mind, the air is not coming all the way out to the top of her head. If it came out here, complete unrestricted airflow. But anytime you take something, a hose or something like this, and you bend it, that automatically... Um, pinches things off to some degree, automatically uh, puts a squeeze on it, automatically makes a bottleneck. So just the nature of our human body up here and out here, we already have um, a natural bottle bottleneck and it happens right here at the tongue arch in the throat. A lot of people think their tongue is just here in your mouth. Your tongue actually goes all the way down um, here. It actually goes a lot further than you think. 
And so when you raise your tongue up into a knee position, this starting here and creating that more of a bottleneck at your throat all the way to the, to the, um, the roof of your mouth right behind your teeth. So this is the second stage of compression tongue arch. In fact, I've done a couple of really in-depth video tutorials, so I don't feel the need to actually do a duplicate or be redundant in this particular installment. No need, no need to. So you can either look for, you can either search tongue arch in, in the normal Google search, you, or sorry, normal YouTube search, you can put tongue arch Kurt Thompson, or if you're on my channel and you're able to search my channel, then you can just put tongue arch. And you're going to come up with several videos that where I really explain and get in real nitty gritty, almost disgusting detail about the tongue arch. So tongue arch in the bottleneck here at the throat is the second stage of compression. It's where um, if you had a garden hose and you took a garden hose and you had a certain amount of water flow and you took it and you bent it, you know, you would hear that noise that it makes, but you would also know that the water is going to spray out faster. Or if you put your thumb over the end of a hose and covered almost all of it up, you know it would get harder to do because the water is going to um, spray out like a jet. So anyway, to make to illustrate a point, um, for people who don't have the tongue arched, arched down, don't have it mastered, or in my experience, it seems like a lot of people think they actually have it, but they don't, um, you end up using a no compression um, second stage um, technique and it doesn't really work out too well with the other stages. So no compression would be like this. I'm going to take some paper, just a little bit, let me get a little spit wad. Okay, just a little bit. Now I'm going to wad it up. Of course, it's a spitball, so i got to put it in my mouth. I'm going to put it here in, in the um, paper towel holder, right kind of at the beginning. I'm going to take a big breath and blow. Okay, it came, it actually came out a little bit, right? It came out with a certain velocity. Now, in fact, it actually went about two feet on the carpet. So now, I'm going to also do another spitball. Put it. And put it in the straw. Now, folks, what do you think is going to happen here? You saw it's in the straw. What do you think is going to happen with this when I blow it? I'm going to blow. Actually, I'm going to blow as much air as I can, but it will be quite a lot less air than I was blowing through this guy. Bam! Do you hear that? That thing hit hit my stand and bounced back within a half a second. Here it is on the floor. I mean, let me do that again. I mean, it was like almost like a bullet. Watch. I'll do it right at the camera. You see that? The speed had to be, I'm going to say 20 times or more than the speed that I got from this. It's quite incredible. Here it is again. I'll do it one more time. I'm just having fun. But um, now I'm, I'm blowing some um, fast air because of this restricted space. I'm also blowing a lot less air. You know, so when you hear band directors and other people um, especially non-brass players, but it could be any band director who's a generalist or it could be your typical classical uh, PhD, DMA, university professor, and they say, more air, don't pinch, open up your throat. That's fine when you're playing low Cs and when you're playing middle Cs, not when you're playing double Gs. Here's your double G and double C.
I bet it went so fast you couldn't see it. It hit the camera, and you might can spl uh, slow this down. It hit the camera and then came back. I mean, it's just amazingly fast. Now, what does it have to do with brass playing? This is where most people screw up the second stage. They keep their jaw dropped down low. Uh, like you got an egg in your mouth. You're playing like that. I've seen people play like that and they pooch out their lips. You really think you're going to vibrate these lips fast after you make them thick and pouting? No, ma'am, you are not. This is the uncompressed zone of stage two. Lower look, the jaw, the lower jaw is dropped down low. Tongue is flat. Ah, uh, this is exactly what your band director, exactly what your university professor is wanting you to do when they say. Don't pinch off the air. Don't pinch off your throat. Keep an open sound. Keep the air moving, airflow, all this kind of stuff, right? That is actually what they want you to do, and they are actually correct when you are playing in the staff and below. What most of these people fail to delineate for you because they can't really do it themselves is when you get into upper register. Upper register, let's remind you what that is. Anybody know? Oh, no, that's not it. You know, a high G right above the staff is not upper register. That's upper middle register. Double C? No, nope, that's that's actually extreme upper register. Upper register is high C, high D, high E, high E, high F, double G. That's the um, tessitura of the upper register for a trumpet, and you can um, transpose that to your particular brass instrument. So uh, these people that have all the advanced degrees and... Uh, are uh, connected and able to get into the universities and you've heard them play right well anyway these people are regurgitating what their um, um, DMA told them when they were getting their degrees it's just a, a regurgitation of generation after generation after generation what they're saying works fine when you're playing below the staff so if you got a concert tomorrow and you're playing come to Jesus and whole notes in your highest note <laughs> Is the second line G in the staff? Yes, they are correct. Don't pinch off your throat. Ah, open position, no compression. If you're playing in the one o'clock lab band at North Texas State University, or UNT as they call it now, and you're starting off on Gabriel, or not Gabriel, start off on Berlin, uh, what the first three notes would be high B, high D, double G, right? I'm swearing, ladies, if you try to keep your throat open, your jaw dropped down low, your tongue dropped down low, you are going to crash and burn. And if you have the chops to actually get those notes, it's going to suck horribly. It's going to be bad. You might not even make it through the end of that tune because you're going to be burning up your chops. This is really important. It's really probably, if not the most important stage of compression, it's, it's right up there. Because uh, even if you had one lung, and couldn't perfectly do the execute the first stage of compression but you had this you're still going to be do, doing okay so anyway you saw for yourself you witnessed it a wide open cylindrical which is keep your throat open hey don't pinch off the air jimmy use more air more air bigger sound jimmy well if that is, professor is talking to jimmy who happens to be playing high a's up to high c's he doesn't know what he's talking about it's less air, Jimmy, and more faster compression, Jimmy, when you're playing up to around high C and higher. That would be the correct thing to tell that student or that particular player. So you just watch the second stage of compressed air, compression, air compression, as it relates to brass instruments. And you saw it in action, folks. Saw it in action. This is when you're using the tongue arch. And this is when you got the low C, no compression position. You can think of this as like when you're fogging up a mirror or, or a glass in your car. You know how kids do. That's low C. That's no compression. That's your throat and mouth all the way as open as it, it can be. The most quantity of air comes out. It's warm air and it's slow moving air. Great for lower register work and maybe middle register work, but definitely not when you start to climb out of the staff and get into the upper register. I'm Kurt Thompson, and as I always like to say, my story, and I'm sticking to it.
Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. How can you find the best trumpet lessons by the best trumpet teacher? The best one for you. That's what this video blog vlog is going to be about today. And, you know, it's kind of a interesting and obvious question that uh, people don't ask until a lot of times they've gone through several different trumpet instructors and trumpet teachers, you know, for their trumpet lessons. And uh, how did I arrive to conclude that? Well, um, number one, it happened to me when I was younger. But number two, a lot of people that come to me for my course, uh, especially on trumpet high notes and trumpet upper register, trumpet uh, endurance, all that kind of good stuff, almost always they will have studied from somebody else and not just their local community teacher. Um, I've had people that have studied with Roy Stevens. I've had people that have studied with Bill Adam, um, um, Doc Reinhardt. And I've had people that I'm um, actually studied with um, uh, Wayne Bergeron. I had I've had a couple of students that have taken the $120 uh, lesson with Arturo. I've had people that have come from um, some of my um, more direct competitors that do a lot of similar things uh, that I do as far as uh, helping trumpet players online um, with trumpet lessons. So uh, they all arrive at the same conclusion that whatever they were doing might have been okay and might have done them a little bit good but did, didn't really get them where they wanted to as far as reaching their goals. So really in a nutshell there's two simple things that you can follow to end up with the best trumpet lessons for you by the best trumpet teacher whether that be an online trumpet teacher um, or um, an in-person um, uh, trumpet teacher as well. So the first thing is I mean, this is so simple, but I guess even myself when I was younger, I just kind of glossed over it. Study with a trumpet teacher. Take trumpet lessons from a trumpet teacher that actually can do what you want to accomplish. That's number one. And number two, you got to make sure that the trumpet teacher you want to take trumpet lessons from has demonstrated results. And that means in the form of students that have already taken from him or her. So those are the two things that we're going to talk about a little bit today. So the first one is um, pretty straightforward. I mean, let's, let's give you an example. Let's just say that you want to be the best orchestral trumpet player in the world. And orchest orchestral music, chamber music is your thing. And you wanted to find some trumpet lessons by a trumpet teacher that could help you accomplish that goal. Now, if you start taking lessons with me, I can help you out with some of the technique and pedagogy that will enable you, able you to be a better orchestral player, but um, I've got to be honest, and I'm not going to beat around the bush. I don't play orchestral music all that much. I've never been in the top symphonies. I never have really wanted to, and it's just not my thing. I mean, it's just not my thing. I am not an expert at it, or even close. So if you came to me and studied with me for a couple years, and maybe you've never even told me about your goal, about being an orchestral trumpet player, you're going to get good in certain areas, but wouldn't it be better for you to pick one of the top orchestral guys in your community or nearby community and study with that individual, guys or gals? So um, there, that's one example right there. I mean, 
get with the person that can play the way you want to play. That would be number one. Another example would be, um, let's flip-flop that. So i just give you a reason why you wouldn't want to take lessons. But um, I'm not trying to use reverse psychology on you here and steer you away from me. But uh, by and large, the people that actually come to take trumpet lessons with me actually do so uh, because they want to in increase their um, their trumpet high notes, their trumpet apparatus, their, their, their endurance on their trumpet, the strength of their embouchure here for trumpet, all that kind of good stuff. That's why people t tend to come to me uh, for lessons. And they also want to learn how to um, either get in the, the jazz game as far as commercial jazz and lead trumpet and rock. Um, or they already know how to do that and they want to go up to the next level and really become one of the top tier lead trumpet players. Um, that would be when you start playing books that tend to have a lot of, a lot of notes in the lead trumpet section above F's and G's, um, F's and double G's. So that would be your top tier um, kind of lead trumpet playing, and you already know what that is. Louis Belson, Buddy Rich, um, Maynard Ferguson, uh, uh, big fat band stuff. So that, and then there's other lesser known. Um, charts in composers and bands but still have stuff above the F and double G. I mean that stuff is raunchy and difficult to play. Raunchy in, in a good way. I mean it's it's um it's tough. It's tough stuff, especially when you gotta play more than one chart. So uh, if you're taking um from the world's greatest um second book player, Jazz Improv, he doesn't really or she doesn't really do much more than that. That's how they make it. maybe they live in New York. And maybe all they do is just jazz, jazz combo, jazz this, you know, um, jazz at Sunday brunches, you know, all that stuff. And that's all they do. And you were taking lessons from him or her, and just because of the reputation and that they're a good player as a trumpet, as a trumpet player, maybe they even even have a good reputation as a trumpet lesson teacher. But you never really told them about your goals, and um, you might spin your wheels with them, you know, for a year before you figured out they're not going to help me become the best elite trumpet player in the world. And the reason is obvious. They don't do lead trumpet that much. They might do it on a gig here or there, but basically they're a, they're a, they're a jazzer. They're a second book player or you know small combo jazz trumpet. So you want to get with someone who specializes. And that brings up kind of the last point of this. Um, there are people that are all-arounders when it comes to trumpet lessons and trumpet teachers. They can pretty much do decent at a lot of the aspects of trumpet. And what I mean by that is You'll get a guy who could sit in on the second book and sound pretty decent. He could also get up there and play some lead. And if we're talking about, you know, I want to say he, I really mean he or she. I'm just using he for um, simplicity. Uh, we, we can pick the she and say that um, she could go sit in a jazz combo somewhere. She could go, go in the or orchestra and play there. So that's kind of an all-arounder. They can Maybe they're doing sessions and things like that. But for you, if you really want to accomplish a certain goal, it would be better to really focus on what that goal is and get with someone who specializes and someone who is the best in that particular uh, technique on the trumpet. I'm trying to remember, but I think it was Chet Baker. Um, he was. I, I'm trying to remember where this came up. It might have been that big two-hour um, kind of biography on his life. But he made a remark about um, how to be successful in life is to find something that you're good at and make sure that you're better at it than everybody else and every and then everything everything else will take care of itself and I thought that was pretty unique I thought that was um, well maybe it's not unique but I thought it was practical and irrelevant because really you want to you do want to get good at something and be the best at it right so it makes sense if you actually want to learn a specific technique on trumpet you gotta take trumpet lessons with a trumpet teacher who is actually an expert in that particular area so that's kind of last point. So you, you don't want an all-arounder. All-arounder is good for when you're in fifth grade and junior high and high school, whatever. But, I mean, at some point, you'll go into a direction that you really love. Classical, Baroque kind of music, you know, chamber music. Or it could be just, you just love um, listening to Miles and Chet and Coltrane and all those guys. And you just want to be, a, you know, a jazz, jazz trumpet player. And so you've got to find someone that specializes in that and uh, not an all-arounder. Okay, so we talked about, we're talking about right now, just to recap, um, how can you find the best trumpet lessons by the best trumpet teacher out there, whether it be online or in person. 
and we discussed one of the main points is make sure that that uh, particular trumpet teacher can demonstrate the proficiency and expertise in what you actually want to accomplish. So that's very, very important. Now, number two, just because someone can play and is an awesome trumpet player doesn't necessarily mean that they'll be able to teach you and that you'll be able to get the information that they already got inside your noggin and become that good. I'll give you a couple of interesting two cases. And it's very interesting because they're both probably the two best trumpet players that walk the face of this earth. Maynard Ferguson, trumpet player Maynard Ferguson, and trumpet player Maurice Andre. Now, it's interesting and almost a little bit spooky that both had um, two, both had sons that um, I guess originally started out playing trumpet. I think Maynard's son Bentley actually switched to bass. Um, but anyway, this is all legend. You know, I didn't obviously I didn't talk to sit down with Maynard and talk to him about it. But this is what I've heard, and, it, and based on it from several accounts, it seems to be pretty much factual. Um, Maynard Ferguson couldn't teach his own son um, trumpet the way he plays. Listen to that. Maynard Ferguson couldn't show his own son how to play extremely, superbly well like he does on the trumpet with the power and the range and all the stuff that he does. Um, now, some people might argue, well, who, who wants to take trumpet lessons from their dad? You know, maybe they don't get along. Well, I mean, you can play devil advocate all you want with these two guys. The, the bottom line is, when you have a supernatural talent like Maynard Ferguson and Maurice Andre, a lot of it is talent. Yes, they did work in practice, but my friends, you're talking about two of the most talented uh, trumpet players in the world, and, and there might be a lot of what they do that they don't even know how they do it themselves because they just have a natural talent. So that was Maynard Ferguson, couldn't teach his, um, his own son trumpet, had to send him away to be taught by somebody else. Maurice Andre, same thing, had to send his son away to be taught by somebody else. So I hope that highlights and turns a light bulb that just because you're, going, oh, you're looking at someone and going, oh my god, they're, they're such an awesome trumpet player. And they're the best in the world. i got to take lessons from that person. Mm -mm. You might want to take a lesson just to say that you had a lesson with them. Uh, but here comes the point two of uh, this discussion today. You can take lessons from them and expect to get great results as long as they have students that can demonstrate what they learned from, from them. So that's, that's part two of this uh, video. So part one was find a trumpet lesson teacher who can, um, who is the expert at what you want to accomplish on trumpet. Right? We already discussed that. Number two would be to find a trumpet teacher who has demonstrated through his students or her students how well he or she teaches trumpet. And what, if you use these, this two-prong approach, you won't go wrong. But what you're going to do is you're going to become a little bit frustrated. For example, one of the most uh, popular um, trumpet uh, lesson teachers out there right now, and I'm not going to mention his name, uh, but he does happen to live way down under from where we live here in the U.S. Uh, if you go to his site, it's got a ton of actually good information, good material. I don't doubt that he can actually teach, um, you know, pretty decently. Uh, also, he's a wonderful player. But if you notice on his side, he has a lot of accolades from famous trumpet players like Wayne Bergeron. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. I think Bobby Shu, Wayne Bergeron, Arturo Sandoval. Now, whenever I see that, you know, I'm always suspect of it because did Arturo take this guy's courses and go through it and make sure they're up to snuff and that they, that students can learn? He sure as hell didn't. Did Wayne Bergeron do that? No. Did Bobby Shu go through his stuff and spend two, three, four weeks on it just to make sure? No, he didn't. What likely happened is that uh, this particular individual knows these um, high caliber celebrity trumpet players, and it's called the Good Old Boys Club. They're friends. Uh, they know how each other plays. They know each other's personalities. And you got a little back slapping, right? A little elbow rubbing. And they might have just checked his stuff out um, briefly and said, yeah, this, we know this guy. He's a great trumpet player. Yeah, obviously this stuff looks good. We're going to say he's, this stuff is great, and they're going to put their um, John Hancock on it. That doesn't mean that the stuff actually is going to help you reach your goals. You need to have 
something different. So when you're looking at trumpet lessons and trumpet teachers, um, especially online, or because well, it doesn't even really matter in person, you want to make sure there are students that have taken lessons from this particular individual and can demonstrate what they learned, what they achieved. That is really highly critical. It's much more critical than having Arturo Sandoval pat him on the back and say, yeah, good job, man. This is some great stuff. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, good old boys club, right? They know each other. You know, Arturo didn't take his course. Come on. Let's be real. So that is critical. So how do you do that? Um, they call it product reviews or testimonials. Testimonials is kind of the, the, old, the old school way of doing it, testimonials and product reviews. And now they break down into a couple different categories, written product reviews and written testimonies, or um, more lately it's video, video reviews. And which is the best? Video, of course. Because in a video review of a trumpet lesson teacher, you're going to be able to hear and watch the student talk about the course and play and show what they learned. That's really, really important. You can't really fake that, right? Now, I'm not saying that written testimonials are fake because I have written testimonials and written product reviews on my site. They're not fake, but obviously someone could just, you know, type it out and throw it on there, right? So, um... I would recommend that if you're trying to find the best, because you're going to be spending money on this, if you're trying to find the best trumpet lesson teacher for you, for what you want to accomplish, at least find someone who has students that have gained what you want to gain from this particular trumpet teacher. <coughs> Excuse me. And that would be in the best way of product review or um, video reviews and written testimonials. Um, I submit to you, if they only have written testimonials, here's what you need to do for your investigation. Get the full name of that person and Google that name or YouTube search that person, and you can put Trumpet after it. So if it's like Joe Blow, wow, I took this guy's stuff, and it really helped me out a lot. I did this, and I got this out of it, and I got this out of it, blah, 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 blah. Well, take Joe Blow and put Joe Blow in a Google search and then add Trumpet to it and see what comes up, or go to YouTube. You want to find this guy's plane, or her, it could be, you know, could be, you know, a female as well. You want to find their plane somewhere, and how, how do they sound? How do they really sound? So, this is really highly critical. Um, I get to toot my own horn here, right now, because in my 16-week um, trumpet upper register high range course um, that I've been doing for over five years now, based on... The criteria laid out in this video that you're watching right now, it is the most successful trumpet upper register course in history. It, I'm, I'm not even blinking when I say that. It really is. And one reason that can be proved, it's not by me saying it, it's by all the students that have taken the course and got from above average to incredible, incredible results in the course. Some students have had much better success with my own techniques than I did. What I mean by that is, in four months that um, the course takes to accomplish, in, there's never been a span in my life where I went by and worked hard for four months and gained an octave in range. Never happened to me. Zero, I'll be honest, zero. Never happened. But I've had people come in to this course raw and fresh and green, and after four months, I got a couple of standout trumpet players that have gotten an octave in range, believe it or not. And uh, my latest superstar is a, um, a student that gained nine notes, so an octave and one note. That's incredible, folks, if you think about it. I mean, um, I don't know how they do it. <laughs> I mean, I would love to be able to do that. So I'm tooting my own horn here, but guess what? If you um, check out some of the links uh, below in the description of this video, you'll see that, yeah, I'm, I'm just ba making you aware of the course and that it is the best and most proven course in the world right now for increasing your trumpet range and your trumpet high notes and endurance. But I'm saying that I'm the teacher of the course and the originator of the course, but when you click on some of the links, you're going to see player after player after player talk about, demonstrate it. It's just pretty phenomenally amazing. It really is. And I'm talking close to 50 different um, trumpet players and also other brass from different levels. Some of these guys are professionals. 
some of these guys are doctors, attorneys, accountants, and some of them are um, freshmen um, in high school. So it's just pretty amazing. So I just had to put in my own little plug there. And um, when you research me, for example, um, I actually can demonstrate and play this thing as far as uh, being proficient in the upper register and the extreme upper register. And you can watch me do it. I've done it in front of, you know, large audiences. I've done it in the studio. And then I make these interesting little um, YouTube clips and I'll play some trumpet high notes on them or whatever. So basically I, I can demonstrate it and then, but how do you know if I can teach it? You know, maybe I'm just a hot dog trumpet screamer that likes playing high notes. How do you know if I can actually, you know, impart that wisdom? It's because of the students that have gone through my course that have taken the course and become extremely successful at uh, expanding their upper register and their trumpet high range. So I hope this um, trumpet lesson tutorial hit home some obvious logical but most oftentimes elusive points that and I'm recapping right now so if you've been writing this down uh, you can you can shake your hand out a little bit and then okay get ready here we go so finish writing down here some notes um, gotta find the trumpet lesson teacher that actually actually can play the way you want to play that's the number one number two you want to get um, you want to verify and ascertain that this particular trumpet lesson teacher has success at teaching so not only can they play that well but they can impart that wisdom and education and pedagogy um, to the trumpet student via their trumpet lessons. And if you follow this advice, whether it's you like my program, I'm not assuming that you're wanting to increase your trumpet upper register. You might be wanting to become the best jazz trumpet player in the world and you really want to become uh, the next Chet Baker or Miles Davis. So I'm not assuming that um, you're wanting to you know, be, become the next Maynard Ferguson or something like that. But whether it's me or whether it's something else, you want to use this two-prong approach. And I will promise you, if you follow the advice that I'm giving here, you will come up and start taking lessons, trumpet lessons, with the best trumpet teacher um, in the world that you can find. And what's so cool about online is you can find the best trumpet lesson teacher in the world for you. And think about it, folks. You're going to be spending time practicing, and you're going to be investing money in this teacher and the trumpet lessons, and you want to get the biggest bang for your buck, right? It's obvious. So it was good to talk with you in this video blog, the vlog, about um, how can you find the best trumpet lessons by the best trumpet teacher. And I hope it all made sense to you. Um, I think the time that you invested here, just sitting and listening, um, to me talk about this is just going to pay huge dividends back um, in your playing, the efficiency, saving you time, money, and being with the right person, whether it be a he or a she. There are plenty of women out there that can teach and play just like men. So don't um, be close-minded. Keep your mind open to anybody that can play the way that you want to play on the trumpet and they could probably um, teach trumpet lessons if verified by their students. So I'm Kurt Thompson. It is a pleasure giving you some advice on this. I got a couple more videos that are going to be coming after this one, so do look for that. If you have any questions, of course, you can email me at Kurt at TrumpetSizzle.com. My name is spelled K-U-R-T and then at TrumpetSizzle.com. But I usually throw some links right down in the description. So um, this should be there in the first couple of lines and you can click on some different links. And anyway, I wish you all the best in tackling and mastering this guy. Statics and squeaks from the Roy Stevens William Costello palming method. Um, I'm Kurt Thompson and this is a video tutorial on how to get started on the static and squeak part of their program. I've gone through their entire program and I changed my armature even temporarily and I could say that um, 
it wasn't really my cup of tea and I didn't get a whole lot out of it except for a couple of great techniques um, that will actually build your, your range and your flexibility. So they're definitely worthy of including in your routine and that's what we're doing today. I will say that I don't encourage or even advocate you switching to the armature. I'm not even going to tell you about it today. We're only doing these techniques as I've tweaked them. So I've cherry picked these out of the Roy Stevens, William Costello uh, palming method and uh, I've tweaked them a little bit my own way. So whatever you see here will probably be a little bit different than um, a Roy Stevens disciple would, would actually teach you. But um, I like how I do it and I've, I've liked the results that I've seen from students in my four month upper register course over the last four and a half years. So this actually works the way I do it. So I encourage you just to follow this and not get distracted um, with other ways. So um, keep your normal armature setting. Keep that normal armature setting you're using. We're not going to um, be changing armature setting right now. We're using this as, a, this as a tool to increase your range and your flexibility. These are the static and squeaks, the, the static and squeak technique that uh, Roy Stevens and William Costello talked about. Uh, the name comes from squeaks, like you'd hear, like any, like any squeak, a door squeaking, uh, a machinery squeaking, static from like your air conditioner, central air or heating. You know, it kind of makes that worrying kind of static sound. That's where it comes from. Here, we're not going for a full-bodied sound, as in the harmonic arpeggio. So, if you haven't got that, the harmonic arpeggio tutorial, you definitely want to get that. It's like the kissing cousin of this one. Um, there, in that particular one, we're going for a full sound. Um, everything sounds normal, when you're going up um, harmonically in open position. Um, here, we're not going to do that. Here, we're actually going for altitude over a normal sound. So we're, we're going to really back off on the air that we blow through. We're still trying to compress and make the air go through the horn faster, but we are definitely backing off on the air. We're starting much, much softer. In fact, the tone usually doesn't sound that great on this one. It sounds a little bit shrill, it's much softer. We are trying to go for um, altitude, trying to go high. So that said, we don't start low like we do in our harmonic arpeggios. We are gonna start high, relatively high. So, um, for most trumpet players, I think that you could probably start on G right above the staff on this one. French horn players, I would encourage you to at least start at um, possibly E, the fourth space E in the treble clef. And trombone players, let's have you start somewhere around, now yeah, let's see here. It wouldn't be a bad idea to start uh, somewhere around the, the B flat or D right above the bass clef staff. If you could start on the F, uh, that would be great. But um, you choose um, B flat or D. D would be actually better right above um, the bass clef staff. So that's where you guys need to be starting. Uh, and then if you have a more of an advanced development of your armature, you definitely want to start higher. So I'll, I'll pick a couple of starting points and show you how it works. So just starting on G, this is concert F G on the trumpet. Of course. Um, if you haven't had the other tutorials, what we're going to be doing is laying the instrument um, in the palm of your hand, but the, the hand doesn't allow any kind of curvature, so you can't really curve and pull the tubing in. So for trumpets, it's the easiest. You just lay the horn over and bring it up to your chops. The only pressure that you are able to get would be the weight of the horn. Trombone players, it's very similar. If it's too heavy, you could also use two hands trombone players like that if necessary. Um, French horn players, you definitely have to use two hands. You're just not going to be able to balance it that well. So I've had trombone players, trombone players, trumpet players, and French horn players go through the four-month brass upper register course and successfully been able to do this one. I don't yet have any data on euphonium or tuba players, and I'm just going to go out on a limb that um, definitely tuba players, I don't know if that's even a go. Um, I don't think it would be possible. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and euphonium players, I don't have any experience with that yet either, uh, maybe at some point. But So for right now, it's just uh, I'm talking to you if you're a trombone player, French trombone player, or trumpet player. So starting on G, just a G right up with the staff, and we're not going for a big full sound. I would call that one round, and I want you to do about five rounds of these. 
Um, so you can rest in between each one. So basically one round is um, doing this in one, however long you go in one breath. Um, now that's involved. That's if you're involved in my four month breaths upper register course. If you're not, you could de definitely stretch yourself to a total of 10 of those. So that would be one round and I would rest, <clears throat> flutter my lips, maybe wait 10 seconds and do it again. Maybe wait 20 seconds depending on how I feel. So now let's just pretend that you have a little higher range and this time you're going to start on high C or high concert B flat. This would be if you're trumpet. For other instruments you're going to have to transpose that. Okay, there we got to triple G at the very end. So we're going for altitude, folks. We're not going for sound. We're just going for altitude. Roy Stevens and William Costello believe that um, the harmonic arpeggios work a certain set of muscles in your chops, and that the static and squeaks worked a different set of muscles responsible responsible for um, playing that upper register. So that's I think that's why you see them paired up like that: harmonic arpeggios and the static and squeaks. You're kind of um, you're kind of covering all bases as far as your embouchure development when you're doing that. And so uh, the last one would be you could start even a little bit higher if you wanted. Um, sometimes I just um, I just like shooting you know, shooting in the dark, but I just try to start high and go even a little bit higher. There we go. I don't know if you heard that, but it was just a little touch of a triple C at the end. Came out about quadruple piano, and um, so I kind of mix and match. Sometimes I'll start off. Well, I usually don't start off on G. I I will start off on either high C, the second one that you heard me do, or the last one that you heard me do. So I kind of alternate back and forth. I only do five of these five rounds, and the reason is is because I go through all sixty-five techniques um, in my course just about every day. It's a lot of techniques. It takes a lot of time. And I just don't have time to uh, to invest a whole a whole lot on any one particular technique. So anyway, that is the um, Roy Roman William Costello static and squeaks. And for a quick review, remember we're going for altitude over sound. So you want to be soft. These are not going to be normal notes you would be playing anywhere in any any kind of ensemble. So they don't really sound that good. They're very soft. They're very squeaky. Uh, they're not really in tune. That's, we're not going for that. We're going for altitude only. We're trying to go as high as we can, soft. And remember, you got your horn. You're not curving your fingers. You're laying the horn right in the palm of your hand. Palm of your hand. And you're only using the, the um, weight of the horn only comes at an angle. And that's all the pressure you get, folks, just the weight of the horn. So trombone and French horn players, you might have a slight advantage, obviously, because uh, the weight of your horn is more. will give you maybe just a little bit extra um, ability on this particular technique. All in all, when you factor this in, you got the static and squeaks, the harmonic arpeggios, the two isometric uh, techniques, plus the pencil exercise. It really is uh, a super combination to energize your range building and endurance enhancement uh, routine. I would definitely encourage you. Uh, just to repeat, um, this one here, if you happen to get the entire uh, Roy Roman, William Costello video tutorial package that I have, which would have all of them, um, you could allocate between 10 and 20 minutes um, per day for all these techniques if you really like them. If you're in my course, don't do that. I want you to keep it at where I told you originally. So if you're involved in my course watching this particular tutorial, I want you to keep the, all the Roy Roman and William Costello palming techniques between 6 minutes and up to 10 minutes a day. And no more than that. Simply because you have so many techniques that are going to be piled on top of you. You don't want to be doing this, um, overdoing this or be overkill. So uh, I'm trying to think of anything else I can tell you about this one. I would just encourage you um, to use all um, the Roy Stephen and William Costello uh, tutorials I have because they kind of all go together. They all kind of dovetail nicely. Um, but if you need to start off um, one by one, uh, then no problem. Go ahead and do this one. 
but do look at the other ones. They are important. They do work together um, to make your goals happen uh, quicker. So anyway, this has been my tutorial about the William Costello, Roy Stevens tutorial. It's Kurt Thompson's way of um, tweaking um, some of their material. And I know that if you invest time on this, it won't take that long to start seeing results. Give it a couple of weeks and you will start to kind of have that feeling of surety and strength here when you go to play, especially in the upper register. So don't forget it's trumpetsizzle.com. You can always go there and click on the products page. I have a ton of video tutorials right now stretched all across the board from all kinds of techniques and I know that they'll help you as well. So trumpetsizzle.com. I'm Kurt Thompson. Catch you next time. High school senior trumpet player plus horrible weak high C's and D's or even worse range below high C equals stupid 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 let's define stupid. Stupid is when you do something and you already know there's a better choice, a safer choice, or a smarter choice, yet you choose to take the action that is the worst or the dumbest or ends up being stupid. <laughs> so, how do I know that you are stupid if you are a high school senior and you can't play high? It's because you've commented on my videos before and I've looked you up. You've commented on my videos. Hey Kurt, you know I'm a senior in high school and um, I really want to be able to play high C for a marching band but I'm having lots of trouble. I play on a 3C. Is this a good mouthpiece? mouthpiece for me or yo mr. Thompson I'm thinking about taking trumpet lessons from you uh, but I just want to ask you this one thing should I get the Wayne Bergeron Eric via Shira Yamaha trumpet would that help out my range Kurt my band director said playing high is all about air but you say it's more than air can you please help me out Kurt in all these situations I've given you advice. Now when someone gives you advice and you choose not to take it and you end up suffering, that's stupid. And I'm going to show you some people that are doing other stupid things that are unrelated to trumpet so you can so I can drive home this point to you of stupidity. High school senior trumpet player plus taking my course equals smart. The course has proven itself. You take my course, you get better, you get stronger, you get better range. You don't take my course and you suck at high C and high D 
Stupid. Are you telling me that you can't pick up your trumpet and do this? You can't do that? Stupid. If you already know the right choice, now if you haven't heard about my stuff and you don't haven't heard about me, then that not that's not stupid. If you already know about me and you already know about my stuff and you've already seen my videos, but you sound like this. And you know you do. Stupid. 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 Why are you being stupid? You already know my stuff works. It's proven by hundreds and hundreds of players. So you have a choice to make. And I'm going to put some really cool examples of people being stupid that, are, that is not related to, to uh, playing trumpet. People taking chances with their life. Um, I've, I've been watching all these people lately over the last couple of years die taking selfies. I mean, how freaking stupid is that? I'm going to, I'll show you some statistics about that of stupidity. I'm trying to drive a, whole, a point home about stupidity during my 2019 back to school year promo specials. Okay, now, let me give you a chance to be smart. I'm going to put a link down in the description of a couple of proven courses and proven exercises and devices. Proven. It's actually not even a matter of my opinion. Proven to help you become a better brass player. Could be trumpet, could be French horn, mellophone. Trombone, euphonium, tuba, cornet. Could be any of those instruments, but proven to help you become a better player. I'm going to put some discount links below, or maybe I might put a discount code. You go to my site, you use these codes, you get some of these courses at a significant discount. So let me give you a way to reconcile. If you were being stupid, let me give you a chance to uh, change that. Okay. Now you get a chance. Go ahead and go back to my site and get my course and get it for a discount. 
Hello? And stop playing like this. You're, here you are again, right? Here you are. You're, high, you're, you're, about, you're a high school senior, or almost. Just the middle of August. I know you're doing marching band camp or marching band rehearsals, but when you go to go high, it sounds like this. being stupid. being stupid. Wouldn't you rather pick up your horn? Let's rewind. Be smart. Be smart. Hi, it's Kurt Thompson here. I just came out with a weekly version of my 20 week comeback player course. You gotta check it out. That I hadn't played for over 25 years. When I was playing in my early 20s, quite a bit, uh, I did not know a lot of the things that Kurt has taught me. So there's upper register aspects of this that I, had, I am absolutely a school child learning how, learning how to do it. So I am definitely what I would call a work in progress. I'm getting there, but I'm not there yet. Uh, but I have really enjoyed it. Kurt is a terrific teacher, and I really encourage you to pony up and make the commitment to get better comeback players. These are people who've been off the horn typically for longer than 10 years or, or, or you could be maybe two years but the typical people that come in that are comeback players have been off the horn for 10 years and if you look at some of my comeback player reviews as much as 50 years. Can you imagine that? 50 years of not touching this guy. Hi I'm Dr. Gerald Dowling. I just recently finished uh, the upper register course with uh, Kurt Thompson. I haven't played my horn in 50 years. Joy, 
uh, making music, I would highly recommend Kurt. If you are younger, uh, at any level, whether you be in school, uh, whether you're in university, whether or not you're professional, or you, like me, just enjoy music, give Kurt a try. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Now, not all comeback players are retired, and not all comeback players are on a fixed income or just surviving on Social Security. But many of you are. Many of you watching this video right now have already seen my other comeback video promos, but threw your hands up in the air, knowing that you're on a fixed income and you just didn't have the tuition to start the comeback player course and the tuition starts at $400. Now, there's a $24 weekly comeback player course. It's the same course divided into weeks. You just pay as you go. You pay, you take the course, you like it, then you pay again for the next week and you keep going through the course like that. Perfect for the skeptic. If you're a, um, a trumpet player who would like to get back in gear, you could do nothing better than taking Kurt's comeback player course. So I really recommend that you check it out um, and take lessons with Kurt. He's a terrific guy. Uh, he's a great teacher. He really cares about his students. And uh, what more could you ask for in a teacher? So Dave Aronson signing off. And, and thanks again for everything, Kurt. And speaking of being skeptical, are you? Are you doubting that taking courses online or via digital video downloads and things like that could actually help you out? Well, if you are actually a skeptic, this is perfect. You only pay each week, my friend. You send in your 24 bucks, you take the weekly lesson, you like it, you get better, and you send in your 24 bucks for the next week. And that's the way it goes. Any time that you don't like it, any time that you want to quit, any time you don't think it's worth it, all you do is you just cancel your subscription. It's that easy. You invest your money and you like it and you get good results or you cancel. Perfect for the skeptical musician. Kurt's program has given me the ability to do that. Uh, he's helped me improve my playing, but even more importantly, he's helped me improve my enjoyment in playing because so I'm not focusing so hard on whether or not I can play a note. Now I'm looking more at how do I play that note. So again, do I highly recommend Kurt's upper register program? You bet I do. Thank you, Kurt, for what you've done for my playing ability and my playing enjoyment. And folks, I want to thank you a lot for watching. Now be well. I'm a comeback player, and I just completed Kurt Thompson's 16-week upper register and endurance course, and it was really great. Uh, but actually, I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about Kurt and his uh, brand new course, the Ultra Comeback Player course. I think it'll be perfect for any comeback player, uh, regardless of their goal. In my case, I'd like to be uh, playing back in a, a, a rock group, uh, Latin group, or a jazz band, um, but a player who's just interested in playing for the, their own enjoyment, wants to make progress, uh, uh, and uh, or they want to join a community orchestra, I think it's the perfect uh, structure to get you back into it uh, in, in the right way. In the right way? Hold on a second, Derek, let me interrupt here just for a second. Um, yeah, that's actually the biggest problem for comeback players, doing things in the right way. And that's why I developed this course. Are you studying with a, a local trumpet or brass instructor? 
Maybe you are. And is that person relatively young? Maybe just out of college or maybe they are in college. Yeah. Okay. And are you probably playing, you know, 30 bucks, 40 bucks a week? Yeah, that's probably. So I, I, I bet I got all those right. Now you have to ask yourself a question. How much teaching experience does little Johnny, who's 23 years old, from your local university or community college, how much experience does he have teaching? Ask yourself that question. How much could he possibly have if he's 23 years old? One year? Two years? The second question is, how many comeback players has he specialized in teaching during that one or two years? That's one of your biggest problems right there. The second biggest problem is going to the big university and taking from the, the trumpet guru there. Ask yourself this question. The guy with the master's or doctorate degree in music that's the trumpet professor, how many years of experience does he have teaching comeback players? Now maybe here's where you might think that I'm wrong and you're right. You might think that he has a ton because maybe he's 50 or 60 years of age, but you're wrong. Who is he teaching? He's teaching pimply-faced 17 and 18-year-old kids coming into the college. Hello? He or she at your university, despite the suffixes after their name, is not teaching comeback players. And if they are, it's just a 1% or 2% part of what they teach. Think about it. They're at the college. They're teaching kids. That's all they do, that's all they've been doing is teaching music majors, trumpet majors, trombone majors. They're not teaching comeback players and they're not equipped and they don't have the experience to teach you, the comeback player. Another mistake, another problem, doing things in the right way is just dusting off all your old books from high school band or college Maybe you have the Arvins, maybe you're going through your fight song and trying to rehash all that stuff. That's a failed, failed policy for comeback players. It seems to be the number one policy. Get out your old stuff, and uh, or protocol might be a better way, a better word for that, and just go to town. Get things back to where they were back in, you know, when, when you were 18 years old. <laughs> or back when you were 22 or whatever it was. Uh -uh, that's one of the worst things that you could do. You are not 18, you are not 20, and you haven't been playing the last 5, 8, 10 years straight like you were back then. It's been years, decades. You can't do it that way. You'll crash and burn. Or maybe you've actually been crashing and burning right now as you listen to the sound of my voice. All right, Derek, let me let you continue now. And start feeling confident about yourself and uh, enjoying the whole process. So I highly recommend uh, you give Kirk a call, check out the course, and uh, good luck to you getting back into playing again. You've been thinking about it. You've been on the forums. Maybe you're taking lessons locally. And maybe you've watched lots of YouTube videos and you're thinking about it. But let me tell you, my friend, you keep thinking about it and you're going to spin your wheels. Just get on that treadmill. You're not going anywhere fast. You need to stop thinking about it, pull the trigger and take action. And now with this new release, and it is a new release. There has never been a weekly comeback player version of my course until right now, summer of 2019. You absolutely, absolutely have no excuse not to try this. Try one week. <laughs> try two weeks. You have no excuse. And to sit there and to stare at your TV or stare outside your window and look down at your instrument or go to rehearsal and really suck it and to have not taken advantage of this amazing course what are all these people talking about they're talking about this course but they plunked down um, the big bank account 
to get started. Um, there wasn't a weekly course available for the people that you saw just right now. Uh, but now there is a weekly course. You have no excuses, my brass plane friend. You want to get better. You want to get back in the game, maybe even better than you were before. you got to get involved in this course now. Now is the time to take action. Think now. Think smart and get involved. I'm Kurt Thompson. There should be some links for you to click. If not, look down in the description. Click that. An easy, easy, easy way to get started on getting better and feeling a lot more confident about who you are and your instrument. So long for now. Bye-bye. articulation in the upper register in the extreme upper register did you notice the attack the articulated 16th notes that I did very pointed very clear very articulated a nice lot of crisp pop to them right and of course the tongue is responsible for that along with a little bit of air that would not be made possible without this chops. Okay, and so in this video, you're going to hear a little bit about my opinion on tongue controlled armature, trumpet yoga, super chops, master super chops. What's the guy's name? Um, now, I don't know. You know, these names are not all the tip of my tongue. Uh, Bob Civiletti, if I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, of course, the other guy's name is always on the tip of my tongue because he still owes me money. Jerome Callett. So, I'm uh, making this video in response to literally uh, hundreds of people that have commented on my series. If blank is the Holy Grail, why aren't we all doing it? Well, I have an installment in that series from several years ago. If TCE, Tech Controlled Armature, is the Holy Grail, why aren't we all doing it? And a lot of people did not like my opinion that the Tongue Controlled Armature could work for some, but I rank it as a last resort. And I still hold that opinion, but people didn't really watch the entire video. And I think that I'm just totally down on TC, which I'm not. I'm just saying that there's probably other things to try first. And as a last resort, um, if, if you're still having trouble doing what I just did, an octave lower, and believe it or not, raise your hand if most of you would have trouble doing what I just did, but down an octave, 8, eight BB. See, that's just about everybody. Okay, there's one person sitting over there with his hand down. Well. Just about all of you would have tru trouble doing what I just did down an octave. You're not even going to think about doing what I just did up an octave. And i got to be honest, I'm not even all that warmed up. So what you just saw me do was pretty much um, cold. So let's talk a little bit about why you came to watch this video. Because I mentioned in this video, we'll talk a little bit about TCE, Trumpet Yoga, Drone Callet. This uh, Bob Civiletti. Uh, there's another person that said, what do you know about Richard so-and-so? He's a guy over in Britain. I uh, don't know too much about him. Uh, but I did try to get some of his stuff and um, I've gotten in the past, of course, free. 
I got a lot of stuff from Jerome Callet as he was recruiting me to kind of represent the Callet Sema trumpet. And uh, we're not going to really go into a lot of that because it's kind of kind of negative, actually. Uh, especially, I still have kind of a bad taste in my mouth about the fact that the guy uh, still owes me quite a lot of money. And notice I'm looking right into the freaking camera and not blinking on that one, baby. He still owes me several thousand dollars, but he's dead now, so what can you do, right? He's passed away, so we're not going to go into a lot of negativity about this guy. Uh, but his method and the other folks that have tried to expound on the trumpet yoga from back in the 70s, and then I think he came out with the master super chops. That's kind of when I, when I kind of came on scene when he started contacting me back about 10 years ago. Uh, there's some merit to some of that. In fact, every now and then I do a little spit buzzing myself. Now, I don't do TCE, but there's some hardcore action on the tongue and the whole face set up to spend about a minute doing this. You watching my tongue? And then I'll do that because it really gets the tongue exercise, puts a lot of force on it, a lot of torque. And um, anyway, I've had all kinds of questions, some of them derogatory, some of them neutral, some of, some of them positive comments about my opinion about TCE. And uh, anyway, so if you go back and watch a video, you'll notice that I'm not 100% 100 against it. I'm just saying that it might want to be your last resort. I mean, it could work for you. Just like a lot of these methods, the Stevens could work for you. You know, that I'm sure set. Upper, uh, you get the upper airstream. Airstream hitting the top um, part of the bowl of the, uh, the, the mouthpiece. And you're dropping the mouthpiece a little lower to, be, to accommodate that. That could work for some of you. It's not going to work for all of you. Uh, the, the, the other one, too, the people are trying to compare, at least I think maybe incorrectly, the Maynard Fer Ferguson Protocol. And the TC, I don't think they're the same thing. Uh, I think there's something to do with the ellipse or, uh, I guess, unfurled, possibly, in both, I believe. The TC has unfurled lips because they want your tongue to come through. So your tongue is not locked up against your throat, uh, blocking off a lot of the air and the power. And I believe that's kind of the premise of the TC. And I, it could hold true that the MF protocol might be like that. So again, as I have said before, the MF protocol, there, um, I don't believe it's going to work for most people. But you might as well try it because what if it works for you? It, it could be just a complete uh, miracle pill, and holy grail for you. So same thing with TCE. But you know, um, since I have like Drone Callet, in case you don't know, he just passed away. And um, I just uh, heard about that. Drone Callet just passed away, uh, aka known as Jerry Callet. I guess he goes by Jerome Callet, Jerry Callet. He just passed away. And so, like I said, I'm not going to go into a lot of negativity. I'm going to try to make it either neutral or slightly positive. So he, he did have some, some innovations when it comes to uh, using the tongue. And I don't be believe the TCE method and my tongue arch method are that far apart. Uh, let me move up a little bit closer. I was kind of doing this in the mirror. Now... I'm not able to see myself in the camera right now, so I don't know exactly where I'm at because I'm using the opposite uh, camera on my phone uh, just to get a little bit more um, high, defini high definition. But you know, TCE, uh, if I remember correctly, even with the spit buzz, the tongue is uh, through the teeth, right? Like that. And then you curl the tip down to your lower lip, like that. And that's kind of like the formation of the TCE. And, um, you know, I'm not a TCE expert, as you already, already know and can tell, but I think that's probably pretty close. And maybe somebody who, who only does TCE could correct me if that's not right. But um, you, basically, you're going to have your tongue through your teeth, teeth through. Now, the top part of your tongue will, have, will be touching 
the sharp edge of your talk teeth, then it curls down. That tip kind of rests or anchors on the on the bottom lip. Okay. And you have your kind of aperture between your tongue and the teeth, um, so to speak. Now watch how closely and not far removed that is from how I play. So how I play, and now this is um, above, let's just say above the, the um, staff. I don't play like this down on low G's or low C's, but um, once I get above the staff, uh, my tongue does not anchor on my bottom lip. The anchor is just like an eighth of an inch in front, right on the cutting edge of the bottom teeth, actually a little bit behind, so watch. See how close that is to TCE, okay? Watch again. TCE. And uh, my way. Can you see the difference? Watch one more time. TCE. Now I'm not arching my tongue up to, to uh, create the friction with the cutting teeth. I'm just trying to show you for demonstration purposes. TCE. Tip. Line. You see there's hardly much difference, right? The tip of my tongue is actually anchored be right at the cutting edge of my teeth and a little bit behind. Here. Versus TCE. Here. There. Here. What is that? Maybe an eighth of an inch? Maybe? Maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Not a big difference. The problem I had with TCE um, years ago when I was messing around with Callet because he he wanted me to kind of be a poster boy for his Callet Sema trumpet. And we're going back almost 10 years ago. And he wanted me able to do a little bit of TCE, and uh, which I tried, which is just not my cup of tea. Uh, but anyway, I, I did mess around with it. I, he sent me a lot of uh, free DVDs. He sent me all those master super chops and he sent it all on the house along with mouthpieces and everything else to get me to come over to his side. So uh, I gave it a try, but the problem, here's one of the problems with, in my opinion, with TCE. The lower lip does most of the vibrating uh, when you're playing the horn, um, I think through all registers. When you do TCE, what you're doing is you're essentially kind of cutting out the, the lower lip, and you will notice, you don't have to take my word for it, you will notice that your tongue is vibrating. Look at me, look at me and watch me buzz with TC setup. A lot of the buzz action and vibration is happening right on the tongue. Now maybe that could be good, that could be bad, that could be neutral. In my opinion, it's not necessarily the best. I want all this to be vibrating here, the lower lip. So there's that. Um, you, you try it enough, and if you get it down, you'll find that your the buzz and the vibration, a lot of it is happening on your tongue and not your lower lip. So I think that that has some impact on tone and control. Uh, the other thing is people that do the Jerome Callet way, TCE, I feel, based on what I've heard and seen, that they can probably play pretty high and pretty loud. I don't necessarily think that they have the finesse and the control and the dynamics and the sweetness um, down lower and in the middle register. And when you're playing dolce and um, cantabile, those very singable sections, especially for you classical people, uh, I'm not sure TCE is the way to go for that unless maybe you perfect it. I guess you'd really have to work a lot on it so that when you're employing this uh, method of playing that you are able to sound sweet and be able to play very softly with a good tone and control intonation. So 
Anyway, I brought this up because um, uh, Drone Callet uh, just passed away, or heard recently. Uh, he must must have been close to 90. Had to be. I mean, he's he had to be. He was 80 something when I was dealing with him. So he had to be 90 or maybe 90 plus. So he lived a long, long life, and lucky him. He lived a very long time. And um, so, anyway, uh, I'll keep an open mind about uh, Trumpet Yoga Master Super Chops and these guys that are still surviving. Yeah, I'm probably going to have to go back and see if I got their names right, but uh, the one guy, Bob Civiletti, uh, don't know him personally. Uh, personally, I don't think I've ever interacted with him. Maybe. Uh, I just know that uh, he's pretty good with all the Baroque stuff, especially the high Baroque trumpet. And, of course, he employs uncontrolled Avisher. Of course, I just mentioned Jerome Callet passed away, so he was kind of the head honcho there. And there may some, be some others. I guess there's a younger, newer guy over across the pond, over in England, Britain, somewhere. Um, and his name is Richard. Can't remember his last name. Uh, but he's kind of like the representative across the pond over there for a tongue control to officer. So, you know, I'll keep an open mind. I try to keep an open eye. That's how, that's how I was able to review all this stuff, you know. I've gone through just about every course and every method that you could think of. If you think of a method that maybe I, I don't know about or you think I don't know about, go ahead and drop it in the comment section. And I'll let you know if I've already gone through it and if it had any merit, any value, you know, what I decided about it. So that's my little take on, again, not the only one, on tongue-controlled Avisher, Trumpet Yoga, Master Super Chops, Super Chops, and then they have some German names that I don't remember. Um, should I even try to ad uh, attempt it? Eins Heisen, or... <laughs> now we're into Comedy Central, right? <laughs> Because I'm just going off the top of my memory. You know, I don't speak German. I don't use those German words. But uh, anyway, you know, I said use it as a last resort. So if you've tried a lot of different things, um, you could go ahead and give the TCE a try. I don't think that you're going to find it to be a miracle pill. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't think that you're going to find that you just work on it for a week or two and all of a sudden you're just going to be a complete beast on the trumpet in the upper register, or even trombone. Now, this probably might apply for, you know, a lot of brass instruments. I don't know about tuba, but probably definitely for trombone and maybe even euphonium. But, um, so yeah, I don't think it's an overnight sensation. And remember, there is still only one Holy Grail right now that we all know of, and it's the 16-week brass and trumpet upper register course. It is proven without fail. It works but only if you follow my instructions to the T without deviation. And if you do that, it is the holy grail for, for brass playing. There's only one right now proven that way. The other ones are work for some people, but don't work for most. Let, let's, let that ring in your head. Almost all methods, except for the 16 week course, work for some people, a few people, and they've worked very, very well but they do not work for most. So let that ring in your head, except for the 16 week upper register course. And it's proven, uh, not by me. Why well, prove it? Because I, I'm, a, I'm a poster boy for it and it has helped me, but proven by all the people that have gone through it and had tremendous success to decent success. So, oh, you wanted to hear a couple more articulated high notes? What's that? I already did some articulation uh, in the upper register. Again? Yeah. Okay. I guess I can do a, do a couple more. Should, what should we do? Take one out of the Arvin's book? Yeah, we could. I'm trying to think of one out of the Arvin's book here. There we go. That's, I could probably do that one.
Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson, trumpet player and brass coach. And if you're a comeback player, that's someone who's just restarted playing again after um, quite a long time of a hiatus from the horn, I want to talk to you. And you could be a trumpet player or a trombone player, French horn player, baritone, euphonium, tuba. If you play one of those um, and you haven't played in a while, then I want to talk to you right now. I teach and play music full time. I pretty much have done that almost all my life. But I bet you didn't take that path that I did. At some point, you found a more lucrative career and you went that direction. And you put down your horn because you had to, because you had other obligations. Now life is a little bit easier. Maybe you're even retired or semi-retired and you've decided you want to get back on the horn and start having a lot more fun. But there's one thing that really nags you, and that's playing your horn and enjoying music is much more difficult than you remembered. My name is Don, and I learned about Kurt's course from a trumpet player in one of the bands I play in. I called Kurt. He told me he had some low brass students, and I decided to give it a try. Since taking Kurt's course, I've been able to play it to a fourth above D. That is to a G. Hi, I'm Bob. I've been practicing the trumpet since 1936. I've always had an upper range problem. I just finished Kurt's three month course and happy to say that I've not only increased my range but have added considerably to my endurance. I would heartily recommend Kurt's course. Thank you. Messing around the trumpet, I got a pretty good demo set up. It's a little overbite. A little bit, not much. Just a tad, like a fraction. So maybe I don't have to contend with some of the issues that you are contending with. So here I'm going to offer you some trumpet lesson advice, and it may be applicable to other brass instruments as well. What do you do if you have more of an over, overbite than I do? What happens if you have an underbite, you know, more of a bulldog kind of set? You're going to have to make some adjustments in the pivot of your trumpet. Otherwise, you're going to be, keep fighting the good fight but not getting anywhere. So, I found a, a cool little gag gift for, um, for teeth. I started playing around with it and... Um, I came to some conclusions. I mean, this is an exaggeration. In fact, it's, if I put this in my mouth, it's not going to be exactly as you would feel in play if you have an extreme overbite or underbite. In fact, this makes it very difficult because what it does is a scoop underneath there causes the air to get trapped, so I'm not able to really blow out the way I normally would. It's, it's you know, my lips don't vibrate the same. It's an extreme proposition here, but I'm here to tell you, you can work around any limitations you may perceive about yourself. In other words, 
Uh, we all like to point at Maynard Ferguson and say he had the natural, perfect teeth, lips, um, jaw, muscle, everything. The perfect setup to play a brass instrument. And you can point that out to several other stars. Probably Harry James, Rafael Mendez, Maurice Andre, um, even John Fattis. And John Fattis, actually, I noticed he has a gap here between his teeth. And so it seems like that may assist his playing. Um, perhaps you want him to say like Wynton Marsalis. Um, other great trumpet players. Um, who else could we put in there? Well, maybe Al Hurt before he had his accident. Uh, what else? Maybe Cat Anderson. There you go. The poster boy for probably the perfect muscular and jaw set up for playing a brass instrument. He probably could have played tuba uh, just as well as he could play trumpet. So you can rationalize and say, well, these people were just blessed and therefore I'm always going to be a third chair player uh, because I'm, you know, I just didn't have the, the genetics that they did. There is a small little truth to that, but it's small. It's like a half percent. The real story is you can overcome any limitations, most of them, unless you have a severe scar or accident or malformity in your chops, you know, like a cleft lip where your lip is just really um, severed and you can't get the vibration might be one of those reasons you could really rationalize why you're not playing a brass instrument. Um, or if you're like Al Hurt, I guess a chunk of brick um, got thrown up when he was a maitre d' in a parade and a chunk of brick threw up and it smashed him right in the mouth. It just really messed up his playing for the rest of his life. He never was the same. Those kinds of things, yeah, uh, would affect your playing and you could rationalize why maybe you want to switch to piano or guitar. But for the rest of us, it's just an excuse for where you are right now and why you're not getting any better. Um, got to get rid of the excuse, get right on the horse, start riding again and try to figure this stuff out. By watching this, you're going to figure it out, uh, part of it. The overbite person, what is that overbite person going to have to do? Um, let's just put the teeth in. I got an overbite. This is going to be silly. This is an exaggeration. If you have an overbite, it won't be as bad as, I'm, as what I am encountering here. But um, let me just put the teeth in. I can't, it doesn't even feel the same. I mean, of course it wouldn't feel the same, but I mean, it's real freaky. So, put it in. If I play it straight on. There's some limitations um, I experienced already, and it's probably because of this. It's not the true representation if you had a decent overbite. I mean, this is much worse. So what if we try pivoting the horn up a little bit and see if that would matter? Um, or if it would be the same or worse. Let's try it. Return. Okay, now I got the double G, um, and a lot of you might be shaking your head saying that's ridiculous, Kurt. You just heard you play a triple G. Well, it's not ridiculous because most of you cannot do what I just did, okay? I just picked up the horn and did it, and you could see I wasn't sweating bullets and passing out. Let this be a lesson to you. I just pivoted the horn up and... Uh, it helped me out a little bit, even though I'm using something funky. Now, what happens if I left it straight or went down the other direction? Now, this is an overbite. Look at extreme overbite. I'll do it straight on. I'm just not getting the buzz happening in the inefficiency the the way I did when I tilted and pivoted the horn higher. I'm guessing if I go pivot the horn down, it's going to be even, uh, it's going to be a deal, deal breaker. Let's try it.
worse. Okay, so this is an extreme, almost non unrealistic representation of, of any of you that have an overbite if you're a brass player. Uh, but what you what can you learn from this? Now this is extreme. You learn that if you have an overbite, that's where your top teeth hang over your bottom teeth. A little bit or a lot. That the more that you play straight on or you're pivoting down, you're going to be worse. You're going to be a worse player. At the very least, let's just say that you can play everything fine, but your range is going to be in the gutter. Okay? You just heard. Straight on and down, you got an overbite. It's bad news for you. Therefore, you can take, um, you can pay heed to this free lesson that I'm giving you and experiment with different levels of pivot from center to a little higher. Now, I'm not talking about an extreme pivot. I'm just talking about you're playing on. And if you have an overbite, you might want to experiment with just a fraction, a couple degrees uh, north. Are you, are you getting that here? Maybe a little bit. Maybe just a little bit more. So you're going to have to experiment with a little bit of a pivot and see where your sweet spot is. Um, I'm guessing it's not going to be an extreme pivot because that's just going to be just as bad as um, you know maybe your current setup. So you might want to experiment a week or two with just a small pivot of the horn upwards. If you have an overbite, little to extreme. Now, uh, if your overbite is about like mine is, which is almost a nil, just a little bit, um, you may not need to worry about this. I mean, I don't consciously try to pivot my horn up or down. I feel like I play straight on, but there may be a little bit of pivot there, but I don't consciously try to do it. Okay, now for you folks that are bulldogs. Hey, guy, come here. You see little Johnny over there? He's looking kind of cute. Yeah, no, I'm, trying to, I'm, make, I'm making fun of you, um, um, <laughs> you underbite people. I think of like the dirty old man, you know, that you see in those old, those old sitcoms, you know, from the 50s or something like that. Uh, but anyway, I digress. Let's get back to what we're doing here. If you have an underbite and you have that bulldog kind of look, either a little bit or a lot, that's people that do this. Now that's extreme. But some people, when they shut their teeth, they shut and their lower jaws is the teeth here like that. Is that you? See that? If you shut your teeth and naturally your lower jaw is a little bit more out, you um, have an underbite, a more of a bulldog look, and, and when you, you know, if someone were to look at you, and you're going to have to probably, I'm going to guess, pivot down. So let's put this in reverse. We'll put it down here. So it's down here. Now I got an underbite. See? Lower teeth coming out. So let's try this again. Uh, straight on. But now let's try. Um, I'm just coming up with a couple of equations in my brain. Obviously, I think if you have an underbite, you're more blessed than if you have an overbite. It could be that underbite allows you to have more of an upstream um, um, air delivery into the mouthpiece, causing you to be an upstream player. And you might have an easier time with range. You can understand by this coming out, when you blow, the air comes up, it's hitting the upper part of the bowl of the mouthpiece in here. The air is coming up this way. And traditionally, most brass players and um, academics would probably agree with me that you're likely to have faster air and be able to have an easier time in the upper register. So it appears that by having an underbite, maybe that predisposes you to an upstream air position. But now let's go ahead and work our way down, pivot down, and see if that the pivot up was good for an overbite. Let's see if the pivot down is good for the underbite.
Okay. Dramatically better than what you just heard when you thought it was coming out pretty good when I got the double G when I had a straight on to a slightly pivoted upwards. Uh, yeah, that was not bad. But with the underbite, when I, as I pivoted down lower, things magically got easier for me. So what can you get from this free trumpet lesson? And if you're a baritone player or tuba player, you can maybe even take stock in this or trombone. The moral of the story is, if you look in the mirror and you shut your teeth, don't try to manipulate anything. And if the top teeth naturally come over the bottom teeth a little bit or a lot, you have an overbite and you're going to want to experiment with a little bit of an upward pivot. If you shut your teeth and you notice that the lower part of your jaw, these teeth are out, out more than your top teeth. They stick out more. You have an underbite. If you don't know what I'm really talking about there with an underbite, look at a picture of a bulldog. They tend to look like this. Right? Just go on Google and search images for bulldogs. They have a severe underbite. So if your lower teeth tend to stick out more than your top teeth, you have an underbite. And we just learned that a downward pivot, experimenting with that, might actually help you have more ease and comfort in the upper register. So I like doing these little experiments. And now I made it hard on myself. This is crazy, unrealistic. I doubt if anybody is um, having to fight the good fight I just did with these fake teeth. So, um, in other words, I went extreme. But you heard I was. Wait, that's another. That's another. Um, another point to back up my fact that nobody is born to play third part. How could I put in this crazy contraption in my mouth? Something that none of you are going to have to deal with, no matter how bad your upper bite or underbite is. It's not as bad as what I experienced yet. I was able to um, go up to double G on the upper bite and up to double C on the low, on the underbite. That just proves my point. But you might be saying, well, Kurt, how were you able to do that? This. Improving, strengthening your embouchure tends to blow past any limitations that God gave you naturally. That's how I was able to do it. And you notice it didn't have anything to do with air. It's I've created a super strong embouchure by practicing what I preach. I practice the 75 techniques in my course. I've been doing it for years. Um, I don't want to give away my age that I'm going to be turning 40 pretty soon, but I've been doing it for more than one decade. So um, anyway, yeah, yeah, I know that's that's a long time, right? Well, you know, it is what it is. This just means I have some experience, right? You know, and you know, you look at that, you look at, you get at the cliff and you're almost 40, you're looking off and it's, it looks like a dark abyss down there. You're about ready to step off into it. It's pretty, pretty scary guys and gals. So it, it just, it just is what it is, but I can still play and I can still think. And so that's your answer. Chops will overcome any limitation that God gave you. It'll overcome if you only have one lung. If you only have one lung, I can still make you play first or principal trumpet or principal trombone because this will overcome that. This, that and the other concepts of air and compression will overcome if you only have one lung. So if you have screwed up teeth, if you have an overbite or an underbite, thin lips, medium lips, fat lips, uh, the strengthening of your embouchure, the systematic approach infused with momentum that's in my course with 75 different techniques one technique one routine might, might likely not work for you guys and i have to say this over and over again but can you hear can you hear this if one approach claude gordon worked for everybody you wouldn't we wouldn't be talking right now i wouldn't be talking i wouldn't have a course we would all like disciples of jesus be doing the claude gordon Okay, if the spit buzz and TCE worked, if that worked, we all would be doing that. What? Why would we do anything else? You hear what I am saying? Think, think, right? Think. Carmine Caruso. If all we had to do was just 
tense our lips up and do isometric contractions and hold out notes for half an hour, if that worked for everybody to build range for brass players, we would all be doing it. That's one technique, one approach. Doesn't work for the majority. There, it works for just a small amount. And that's why you know about those methods. You know about those methods because one or two people have spotted how great it is. You need a course and approach that has a multifaceted shotgun macroscopic uh, approach with techniques hitting you from all kinds of different directions infused with momentum. That is the holy grail to brass playing. There is, you cannot argue it against that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening to me and we would have already done that one method that worked for 100% of everybody. And that one method didn't exist until now. My course, the Holy Grail to Trumpet and Brass Plane, is a 16-week upper register course with 75 techniques. You go through the process and you'll have the strength, regardless whether you have an overbite or an underbite, or some things are screwed up and God didn't bless you the way he blessed Maynard or Cat Anderson or those guys, you're still going to overcome a lot of limitations and you don't have to be stuck at third chair. So, I'm Kurt Thompson and I approve this message. I'll see you in the next one, folks. Bye-bye. Check out that. You see that number one? That's right. I don't know if it's coming out backwards here on the mouthpiece, but this is the largest of all Bach trumpet mouthpieces. I mean, it's bigger than the A cup. It is the original Bach one mouthpiece. And even according to Vincent Bach, it has limited uses. Um, and for me, it has limited uses too. I got it mainly to record Almost Blue on. And so when you hear me play the trumpet solo on Almost Blue, it is being played on the largest Bach mouthpiece. So I just wanted you to know. I also have a sound sleeve on it as well. So today, I'm not really going to be going into mouth mouthpieces. I just wanted to use this mouthpiece instead of my fancy schmancy custom bob reeves so you know we're I'm, you know we're kind of comparing apples to apples here so this video is about all the emails and comments i get just it's like perpetually constantly about um do i relax my lips when i play high do i tighten my lips um roll in roll out and then um, I guess loose lips, these are things that come up over and over again. You can read the comments in my various videos. I get lots of emails and I even got students asking about it because they hear contra I guess contradictory advice out there from different players and different people. So I'm here to do some very close up demonstration of my job. So I'll just play in a couple of notes and I haven't even warmed up today. Literally I haven't. I've done some lip buzzing. That's about it. So I'm trying to, and I'm going to keep this in a range that um, is reasonable. I'm not going to be doing this on triple C's or anything like that. It's just a typical range that most folks might be um, struggling with. So let's let's find out what loose lips can do when you're playing on the trumpet. Not very loose lips. You might equate this with um, kind of chops that aren't that strong. But if my lips are loose, let's get in there. There you go. You can see. 
sorry I have a little a little injury here from yesterday but here we go these are loose lips <laughs> Loose lips vibrate slower, folks. The aperture, like most, like this. Can you possibly play above the staff, get a great sound, be accurate, with a lot of power, with loose lips? I'm just going to have to tell you no. So I don't know who you're listening to. You're probably on the forum somewhere. and Someone's probably saying that um, you're too tight or whatever. You're not going to be able to play above the staff with loose lips. Frozen in time for a double pedal C. A very wide aperture, a very, very relaxed set of chops, very loose. You probably noticed an extreme rollout to be able to accommodate such low frequencies on the horn. You need to get that out of your head that somehow you're going to be able to wail on high C's and D's and E's with loose, relaxed lips. It just ain't so, no matter who tells you that. And uh, if someone is a great player and they tell you that, then chances are they don't know what they're talking about. They just are blessed with natural talent. And they are thinking that they're playing with uh, loose lips, but they really are not. So uh, loose lips are great for um, pedal tones. Um, some pedal tones, obviously, like the pedal C, you can't play too loose. Let me go loose. The, even the pedal C won't come in unless you firm some things up. can see that there's more tension there on the pedal C. Now, the more lip we have rolled out, the more loose and relaxed it is, and probably even a, a larger vibrating surface. An extreme rolled out. How about low C? Okay, now I'm going to freeze certain lip positions so you can watch. Low C, watch. They're rolled in, but um, not extremely. Relatively wide aperture. Now compare middle C to low C. More of a rolling, right? Let's see if I can get the light on it. If you notice the bottom lip is rolled in more, right? Low C. Middle C. Rolled in more. Aperture more narrow. I see. Significant roll in. Lips more tight, taut. Why are my lips, and why should your lips be rolled in and tighter 
as you go higher. The reason your lips are tighter is because you're meeting the resistance of air pressure coming through your mouth. And what the lip, the tighter lips have to do is they have to be able to grip the aperture closer together as you meet the mouthpiece. You can understand that if your lips are not tight enough, the aperture here will widen out slightly and you'll lose that note. Why will you lose the note? If the aperture becomes wider, the air becomes slower and the note will drop. Is that making sense to anybody out there? Tighter? In order to have this very narrow aperture in the taut, um, firm lips here. Now they have to be firm here. They can't be loose. Folks, understand this. You can't have loose lips in the upper register. You can't have a rollout. It's not going to work. This is part of the essence of my 16-week course. You have to build strength here. The strength I'm talking about is the strength of your lips and the embouchure surrounding it to hold the air compression in at a narrow or smaller aperture. Not larger. Remember the, the double pedal C? Is that close? Yeah, it's pretty close. Look at the difference. Lots of lip out, right? You can't be doing that. Uh, above the staff it just is not going to work for you the strength I talk about increasing and when students have taken my stuff my courses and lessons they talk about an increase in strength they're talking about this your lips being strong enough to be rigid and snug in tightly the aperture the aperture is a little hole between your top lip and upper or top lip and bottom lip where the air comes out into the mouthpiece if you can't hold a very small narrow aperture, you cannot um, engage the third stage of compression in regards to brass plane. And that's the air being sped up and stayed that way into the mouthpiece. You need the air to stay compressed until it gets into the mouthpiece. You have to have strength in your lips to be able to do that. You cannot be playing loose or rolled out. The high C, close. A little higher. And remember, I'm doing this on a Bach 1, so I don't even know how much I can go, but... Very tight. Very rolled in. Why is it that tight and rolled in for the double G? It must be so that the aperture, the hole here, can remain like a little pinprick. I bet the hole is probably no bigger than maybe the end of a toothpick. It's very, very tiny. And the power and the strength I'm talking about that I have in my lips is able to keep that contracted. Well, my hand wouldn't do justice. It keeps the hole contracted so that I can keep the pressurized air into the mouthpiece. That's the strength that we're talking about building up. You have to have this strength if you want to be able to play about the staff, number one. Number two, if you want to have a tremendous amount of endurance. Now, if you can do what I just did on, now this is the largest mouthpiece that Bach makes for trumpet. If you can do, for example, the double G that you just heard me do, let's go down four notes. Um, let's say you don't even want to be a screamer. Uh, let's say you hate high notes, but you got yourself to the double G like that. G down to F to E to D to C, four notes to let's say B flat. That means that B flat, B and C right above the staff are almost effortless and you can play those all night. You'll have tons of endurance as long as you don't overblow. And other things being equal, you know, you, you're not sick or not overtired or stressed. That's why we increase the range higher 
higher to the point where skeptics say, oh, we don't need all that range. Yes, you do need all that range. Just because you don't see it in your music doesn't mean that your body doesn't need a comfortable cruising zone for when you're playing your performances. So that is why you increase um, your range. That's one reason. The other reason, of course, if you want to, you know, play high and show off and showboat, kind of like what this guy does sometimes. Well, that's another reason. But the true reason is to extend your endurance and have more fun on this instrument. So lesson learned. You, you can't see it much closer than this, can you? You saw my lips. They have to roll in and become tight so they vibrate faster. But also, more importantly, uh, you constrict the air um, to the aperture that's very small and narrow, with just like a fast compressed air coming out into the horn. It takes a lot of muscle strength, and if you don't have that ability, you won't be able to go higher, or if you get fatigued, you'll drop notes. That's why when you gas out, you lose endurance. A lot of it's because of muscle fatigue. The lips just cannot hold that narrow aperture anymore. So, uh, close up again. I don't know. <sighs> I'm not letting hardly any air come out between my upper and lower lips. What's the difference between me and you? Odds are you don't have the strength in your lips to bear down on that pressure and to keep that pressure going through your mouthpiece. Your lips are unable to do so at a certain altitude above the staff. Your lips then capitulate, they weaken, or, they blow, or the air blows them out a little bit. As soon as the air compression blows out your lips, and we're talking about maybe not even mil smaller than millimeters, just a hair's width, and you can already lose a range that way, a half step, just psh, it goes down quick. There. That is a very in-depth and close-up reasoning of why loose lips and rollout that um, I guess you're hearing about on the forums or maybe some famous player is talking about it, uh, but they're wrong because maybe they have a natural talent and they don't realize that they are using um, a tighter chop setup and a roll-in, but they are, even if, even if they don't think they are. I bet I could um, get with them in person and find out that they indeed are using uh, tighter embouchure. You're simply not going to play above the staff with a relaxed, loose, flappy embouchure. Um, that's for pedal tones and maybe some kind of special effects. You have to build the strength here. Even all the air training in the world, we can get Greg Luganus to pick up trumpet. He will not be able to do what I just did because even though he might have much better lung capacity than I do, he does not have the strength to contain all that air. I'm Kurt Thompson. Um, I just wanted to get down and dirty and up close and personal. and I hope you enjoyed this detailed explanation and um, demonstration. Um, it looks like we got up close and personal, didn't we? We really did. So go back and rewatch this video. You should learn some things from this. Uh, I'm hoping a light bulb will go in your head and you could stop abiding and listening to this misinformation and chatter and distractive noise that you hear all over the internet. Uh, most of it's wrong. Uh, most of it's wrong because most of these people can't even demonstrate what I just did for you right now. They, you could, you know, twist them twist their arm behind their back and offer them a million dollars and they couldn't do what I just did on the largest Bach trumpet mouthpiece, the Bach 1. This isn't a 1C. It's not a 1B. It's not a 1A. It is the Bach 1 trumpet mouthpiece, the largest of all Bach trumpet mouthpieces. So until next time, by the way, if you like this, where's my thumb? If you like it, do a little bit of this. Subscribe, hit that bell notification, and you'll find out other videos that will pop up in your email uh, letting you know that I just uploaded something. And if you want to contribute a couple dollars to the betterment of this channel, there should be a link down there for Patreon, and you can become a patron and be helping out the arts here on this channel. I'll see you next time, and I hope this was of 
information and some help. Bye-bye. with some power behind it and I had a big hunk of Reynolds aluminum in my mouth. Hey, it's Kurt Thompson and welcome to a brand new school year. Back to school. This is my back to school promo and specials for the 2018-2019 school year and are you starting this school year with braces? Oh, these aren't real braces. Uh, but I've already given this a shot. This is a real thick rolled up version of Reynolds aluminum. You can see it's pretty thick. It's very uncomfortable. Kind of hurts. This is a little stunt that I'm going to do right now for you. And I'm not going to be sounding that well with a mouthful of metal in my mouth. But I'm going to show you one key element that will make life easy for you if you do have to start this year, especially in marching band with braces. I know it's rough and tough and it hurts, but there is a way around it. And the way around it is increasing your embouchure strength, your lip strength, and your chop strength. Now, you might have heard people talk about that before, but the real reason you need to do that is to reduce mouthpiece pressure. The weaker you are here, the more you have to smash the mouthpiece in, especially as you go higher. The stronger this is, the more you can resist um, your lips thinning apart and keep the pucker, and you'll be able to reduce the mouthpiece pressure. And that's what you need, especially with braces. So I'm here to prove a point. I'm here to prove the fact that I have an enormously strong embouchure will save me a little bit on a big hunk of metal to my mouth. Now, I'm not going to sound that good. I probably missed a few notes. But I'm here to tell you that even a lot of you have, have sent me comments and questions about the fact that you can't even play out of the staff with braces. I'm here to tell you that once you get used to it, you can go a little bit, but once you build the, the strength here, you can go way on up and uh, without it hurting too bad. So I'm going to put this in my mouth. I have a feeling it's not going to be that fun. We'll try it anyway. It's pretty thick, probably thicker than your braces. It just doesn't have the sharp barbs, but okay, get it in there. And I'll leave this uncut. I'm not gonna cut anything there. Get it in my mouth. Let's see what happens. Middle C. High D. I see. Should I go a little bit more? I F with some power behind it, and I had a big hunk of Reynolds aluminum in my mouth to simulate braces, and this is thicker. I don't know if you can really see that, but it's thicker than what you have in your mouth. It just doesn't have the barbs on it, of course. But that's to prove a point. How come I can put this in my mouth and go up to a high F like that, and it wasn't a squeal or a squeak. It was a full-bodied high F. Like I said it before, I'll repeat it again. Enormous muscular strength on the muscles that surround the lips. That's your embouchure. And then also exceptionally enormous strength in the lips. There's two different things going on there. Uh, the lip material itself is more bristle-like, kind of like your ear or your nose. And then the muscles that surround the lip, you can actually see this if you study anatomy and biology on a real cadaver. It's kind of gross, but the muscles that go around the lips are feathered and striated. 
around. There are two different things going on. That means you have to build and approach them subtly differently, even though they're linked together, obviously, it's part of our body. So you have to build the lip strength and you have to build the embouchure strength. One doesn't take care of the other. You can't just work on your lip strength and expect the whole embouchure to amazingly be supercharged and ready to rock. And you can't just do lip slurs all day long and expect the lip tissue itself to be super strong. Lip, lip slurs tend, tend to work here on the corners. So I'm here to tell you that if you're starting 2018, 2019 school year with braces, I have the solution for you. I'd like for you to look down in the description and click on some of the specials I have. I have a beginning, inter, beginning intermediate course that's really going to help you. It's going to help increase your strength and you can take that course by yourself should you choose or you can add me to it. I have the live version where it's me and you um, every week. So there's just a difference in course cost. But uh, either way, you're going to get something out of it, something very, very good. You're going to have to increase the embouchure strength to be able to play with braces. If you don't, you're going to suffer and you're going to suffer and you're going to suffer. I don't want you to suffer. So by the way, this may be live. If it's live, look down in the little comments section below and hit me up with a comment. I'll try to answer right live, right straight to you. If you're watching this after the live stream, then go ahead and leave a comment. I'm usually pretty good within a couple of days of getting back to people that leave comments. So you're starting the brand new school year with braces. All hope is not lost. There is hope. And you got to come see me. You got to come talk to me. You got to ask some questions. I do have some good solutions for you if you're willing to work and you're willing to invest in yourself. You don't have to suffer this year or the next couple of years with braces. There is a solution. I'm Kurt Thompson. If you haven't already done so, subscribe in one of those little red, red rectangular boxes. Subscribe. You'll see a lot more new videos like this. Go ahead and give this a like. If you have a good comment, leave it in the comment section. If you have a neutral comment, leave it in the comment section. If you have a horrific, horrible troll comment, well, leave it in there and then I'm going to do a little bit of this. Just kidding. Just kidding. So uh, I hope you have a wonderful start to this 2018-19 school. It's back to school time. I'm Kurt Thompson. I'll see you soon.